something happened to your image are you there okay great uh, okay, okay so okay. so and where's your microphone i have it right here actually okay perfect great yeah. okay so um let's see okay so are you ready yeah perfect okay so here we go Yasmina Jimenez, you are a certified business coach. We have the great pleasure of having you based right here in Montreal. And you have helped hundreds of businesses to grow and succeed. So uh, I'm so happy to hear, have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Alain. I really appreciate uh, you having me on the, on the show. And I look forward to chatting with you. Okay, so Jasmina, so I hear, I find you through LinkedIn and I see that you have done amazing work. I have gone to your profile. I see all the activities in which you are involved. Uh, I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about you. Uh, where are you? Where do you come from? I see a mixture of all kind of uh, racial backgrounds <laughs> in your profile. So a little bit of that to get us started, to, to get to know you better. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, actually, I came here when I was five years old uh, with my mom and my brother. I was born in Spain in Algeciras, uh, Andalusia, which is the pro uh, pro province in the south, and Algeciras, the city. And um, But I'm actually half Spanish, half Moroccan, because my father is Moroccan. And okay. um, So yeah. you speak Spanish? And you speak Arabic as well? I don't speak it? Arabic. I lost okay. my Arabic because I grew up mostly in Spain. And when we came here in Montreal, there was more of a Latin community uh, right. from South America and Central America. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of immigrants uh, uh, from Arabic countries. So I lost it, unfortunately. But I do understand, depending where the people are from, because the accents are very different. Okay. Hablas español. Sí, tu pao francés. Uh, oui. <laughs> we are uh, English as well. So you are trilingual. That's that's the typical immigrant that comes here to Montreal. Okay, Absolutely. sorry to interrupt you, but go no, on. No problem. No problem. And I come from an entrepreneur uh, family because uh, both my parents were entrepreneurs. I have a lot of family that are entrepreneurs on both sides of the family. And um, they had actually three restaurants in Spain when I was growing up there for the first few years. Unfortunately, their relationship didn't work. Uh, but... Um, I think it's um, it was a great foundation of what gave me my work ethic and uh, the value also of working with diverse people. Uh, just because we were in the south of Spain, there was a lot of tourism, a lot of mixture of cultures and religions and ways of thinking. So uh, I really, I'm really thankful to my parents. Even though their relationship didn't work out, they gave me and my brother a lot of great values. Hey, I bet that while the, the relationship worked out, they created something magnificent, which is you. So oh. <laughs> something, <laughs> something must have worked out. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so you came here when you five years old. So can tell us a little bit about your journey. What interests you when you were a little kid and what do you, what do you study? Well, uh, very young, I have to say that it was a shock for me. I kept getting punished in school for speaking Spanish all the time. So that's the first thing. Uh, and, you know, I was very lucky to grow up in NDG in Montreal. So it's a Notre Dame de Grasse uh, neighborhood for many years, all my elementary and high school. And all throughout uh, that education, I was always interested in music and arts and sports and certainly in people. Every job I had, I started to work very early at the age of 12 years old in camps and after school programs and community centers and so forth. And what always attracted me was two things. How can I contribute to my community and help those around me? And how can I learn from such diverse backgrounds and ways of thinking and ways of doing things? And I like to think that that was a very good school for what I do right now as a coach. And how come... You started working at 12 years old. Was that your uh, own initiative or were your parents uh, having financial difficulty or was it the entrepreneurial on you? What, what, what inspired you to start working at that early age? I think it was a mix of all those things. 
Uh, my mom, as I told you, my relationship, my mom's relationship with my dad didn't work out. And although my dad was uh, nearby in the neighborhood and we would see him and all that, you know, it was hard work for my mom. She would work from midnight until eight in the morning and then leave that job to go and clean houses uh, to put me and my brother in a private school outside of our neighborhood. Because in the 90s uh, in NDG, there was a lot of gang violence. There was a lot of selling drugs. Uh, I myself found a dead girl stabbed in back of my building at eight years old. I saw a lot of things I was not supposed to see at a very young age. And so my mom was working so hard to try to put us in a private school, hoping to show us another life uh, to, for us to aspire uh, to work hard and, and, you know, that we could create our own life as well. And me seeing her work so hard with no support, very little support, because all our family was back in Spain and in Morocco. Um, I saw how amazing the community services that we had uh, supported my mom when she needed food, when she was missing clothing for us, when we had for many years no furniture, we would sleep on the floor. We didn't have a kitchen table, nothing. We went through a lot of those struggles. And so to see my mom not struggle so much where I could make a little money in the summer or after school to maybe buy some things that I wanted and remove a little bit of a burden, uh, but also to be involved in community service because my first jobs were in, in camps and in uh, community organizations. So it was a motivation of both those things. And honestly, some of the best years of my life. I learned a lot uh, working in, in camps with kids and dealing with parents and all of that. Well, that's amazing. What I find interesting is the power of love and in particular, the power of maternal love. Because you are telling me your mother went to work at midnight, finished at eight o'clock, and then she had an additional job cleaning houses. And, you know, what, what uh, makes me think is these are things that we are willing to do for someone that we love but oftentimes are things that we are not willing to do for ourselves. So imagine you were not in your picture. In the picture, your mother, I don't know, she probably at least will have a regular one single job, not two jobs, you know, and she probably will have. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, sometimes employees, people who have a regular working life, they are willing to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to go to their job, you know, stand one hour. But sometimes the same person is unwilling to spend half an hour for to work out, let's say, to go Absolutely. to the gym, something for themselves. So it's just it's just interesting. Okay, so Absolutely. your mother put you to a private school yeah. without having the means to do it. And then what you went to university or how, how what happened after that? Yeah, well, I think one thing that I don't want to skip in our conversation is I was I felt like I was living between two worlds, living in the neighborhood that I was living with, with that reality, going to take the school bus and seeing drug dealers at seven in the morning and prostitutes and things like and a lot of violence and the police always being difficult, not only on criminals, but on everybody. And then going to a private school where it, where we would go to the theater every month and everything. So I was in between two worlds and I had through high school, I had to learn how to love where I'm coming from and not be jealous of what other people had. <laughs> I had to really face myself and say, yes, Mina, you're a little jealous of the fact that your best friend is living in a mansion and could travel all the time and can do and, and dress how they want all that. I had to really do a lot of personal development And of course, uh, you know, I, I was able to uh, go to college. I went to Dawson. I studied in fine arts until I realized it's a passion, but not something I want to do for the rest of my life. And that's how I went back to, I think, some of my earlier loves and social science and, and community development and so forth. And I went to a Concordia University, a university and I studied human relations. Wow. Okay, so I have a question. So you were in two different worlds, the, your neighborhood and then being in a private school. And I think many of us, presently, we live in two different worlds. We live in our own reality. And then we get in Instagram and we see how Kim Kardashian lives. 
And then we want it all. I mean, we have our resources, but then we have, we want the fancy, I don't know, bikini or lack of bikini <laughs> that she wears and the cars and all this and that. And we are having a hard time navigating those two worlds, the worlds that we get to see in, in, in social media and our real life. And this is one of the reasons why people get into huge amount of debts. They spend way beyond their means because they want to Absolutely. just portray a life that really doesn't belong to them. So my question is, how, and you were able to navigate, to say, okay, this is my life where I live, and this is the life of my friends at school. Yeah. How were you able for so many years, and in addition, being a little kid who is susceptible to all kinds of influences, uh, be able to uh, to navigate those worlds? Um, like, I, I think I have to come back to what uh, my mom taught me uh, growing up all those years, her hard work ethic, and whether we had nothing or we had a little bit more, she always showed me and my brother how to take care of everything that we have and to build on that. So uh, there was a moment that I realized when I was in high school that I was kind of taking for granted all the sacrifices that my mom was uh, doing and, and taking to put me there. And I said, Yasmina, you have to forget any jealousy or envy or frustration uh, or sadness that you see in your neighborhood when you're comparing and really just learn, learn how to grow, learn how to be the best, learn how to discover who you are and what you have to contribute, you know? And uh, a lot of times, instead of me being in my friend's room and their beautiful uh, home, I would be at the kitchen table talking with her father, who was a TV director or the mom who was a, a lawyer. And just, uh, it really attracted me to always surround myself with people who had more experience who are probably older yeah. than me, although I learned from people who are younger than me as well. And it, it just, I started really shifting my mindset to everything that, that's positive, everything that I could improve inside of myself before even thinking about how I could influence other people. And that brings me back to what you just said. You know, we have, when the influencer started in the business world, it was because they invented something. It was because they innovated. Nowadays, everyone wants to just be an influencer with beautiful pictures, and you can't even find out what they're actually doing. So, you know, there's there's that um, misconception that um, you overnight you're just going to be a celebrity. And it's quite sad because everyone, I believe, has amazing talent and knowledge to change, uh, to to share with the world. So uh, I could talk a lot about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so you went to uh, Concordia, you study yeah. what? Uh, can you repeat what is it that you Absolutely. study? Yeah, I did a bachelor's in a specialization in human relations. So that was right. a four year degree rather than three. And it's everything that has to do with um, uh, leadership development, team development, project management. Uh, we got, had a lot of counseling and psychology classes as well everything to learn how to work with other people, how to create and leverage uh, the talents and the knowledge of the group, and a lot about self-leadership. You can't think about how you could influence uh, positively someone else in your team or get people to believe in your mission and contribute to it if you don't have your self-discipline, if you can't manage your own emotions and, and create your own vision. So for me, that was, again, I'm, I'm such a big fan of my program and I talk about it all the time. Uh, I could be a very good poster girl, Concordia, please call me because I'm so passionate about this program. I think everyone should have at least a minor in this program just because of the self-development that is, allows us to, to go through the classes. Okay, great. Uh, well, we would check it out. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then, and then what happened? You graduated, you got a job or you, I, my, I wonder what is it that led you to become an entrepreneur later on? So I imagine Absolutely. you got a regular job or, or, or did you start right away as an entrepreneur? Yeah. So I actually, uh, I was working all throughout uh, college and university because I lived on my own at the age of 17. Wow. Uh, I, I didn't want to put continue putting a financial burden on my mom and just give her a break 
can you tell us about that experience? Because that's another oh, yeah. problem that we have. <laughs> we have an epidemic of student loans of people who cannot yeah. cannot uh, do both things to take care of themselves and go to school at the same time. And you were working. And so yeah, take us, let's Absolutely. go back to that area of your life. We will go back. We will go back. Um, for me, it was my mom had been in a nice, beautiful relationship with my stepdad uh, and they wanted to move to the South Shore. And obviously I was welcome to live with them, but the buses and all that are not necessarily easy to come into town, into Montreal and at the time go to Dawson and so forth. So I told my mom and, and my stepdad, I said, listen, I'm You taught me a lot of things. I know how to cook. I know how to pay bills. I know how to organize myself. And so um, that's why I went to live on my own. And I was working full time, going to school full time, studying all summer as well. I didn't stop um, just because I had that passion and I had found in social science, which led me to, to the program in university later on. I was learning so much as much from my from the students in my class and the conversation and the debates with teacher and all that. And uh, I was convinced I was going to use those degrees and those classes to continue working in the community. Um, and when I finished my program in human relations at Concordia, I had to do a full almost uh, two semesters as an internship. And I'm so blessed to say that I got hired right away by the nonprofit organization where I was interning, which is not a Not a lot of uh, my friends could say the same thing because, as you just mentioned, a lot of people have degrees and they can't necessarily find jobs and they're in debt and so forth. So for me, it was a decision of really just being independent, not accumulating so much debt and just taking control of my life. You know, I didn't want someone else to dictate that I would end up here or there or whatnot or in debt myself. I wanted to work hard. And if it meant I had to take more time to do things then that was okay for me. Quality was more important than going quickly or than looking a certain way. A lot of times I didn't have a lot of food either, but I didn't tell my mom. <laughs> right, right. Okay, and um, what would you... You know, well, you got to well, do the sacrifices that come along with what you want. What would you say to the, uh, I don't know, thousands of people who doesn't think that's possible? I'll tell you what, I, I came also as an immigrant, I came and I studied as well at Concordia, And I was lucky enough to find a loophole that allows me to pay as a Quebecois. Mm -hmm. And so, which is nothing compared to the international students fee. And That's I was great. able, I was able to pay for my school while working under the table as a janitor. Mm -hmm. So it is doable, but I just, I just see that hundreds of thousands of students don't think that that's possible, that they have to get into this huge debt in order to be able to school and i know people who are now in their 40s and still paying uh, uh student loans absolutely absolutely and depending the programs the, those fees are quite high actually and the, uh, and so forth though I, what i could say it's it's like in business whether you're a student uh or you're in business you have to manage your financial <laughs> your financials your budgets right. Um, and don't be afraid of hard work. I mean, for me, it's inconceivable to hear uh, people perhaps between 20 and 30 or 35 say, yeah, I want to retire at 45, but you're not making the decisions and the actions mm -hmm. that are going to get you there. You know, wow. already it, it's hard enough because there's a lot of competition. You know, uh, you have to have the mindset to be willing to do what it takes. Uh, and yes, there are great stories of people overnight becoming celebrities almost, but that's not for everybody. You know, right. it's not for everybody. It doesn't happen every day. And so I want to say, if I'm going to speak to students or entrepreneurs, it's actually the same thing. Take control of your life. Right. Right. <laughs> and if you want to get there, you're going to get there, but it takes hard words. It takes sacrifices and you have to understand how to manage your finances and your lives and your time, especially your time. In a way we have been educated as well that uh, this over-reliance on debt, 
You know, like now you can buy a an automobile and pay it in seven years, you know, because because why not? It's available. Uh, we had to buy uh, houses that are way beyond our means. And of course, why not? While well, you buy the expensive automobile and the furniture and credit, then why not take a trip to, I don't know, Las Bahamas because everybody else does it. And yeah. credit is there. The banks are only too happy to give us as much credit as we want to, as long as we can always pay that minimum balance. Then, then, uh, uh, then the banks are just happy to do it. And we become slaves of that system. And right. listen, there's a lot of wealthy people that everything they have is on credit. Don't give me wrong. Everything they have is on credit. But I don't know. For me personally, it comes down to your values. Me personally, I cannot impose on other people, but I want to have a debt-free life, which I'm very close to that right now, okay? I have to tell you that. And while other people were saying, oh, well, you know, you're developing slowly and you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And I did a lot of sacrifices. It's very embarrassing to not always give gifts at Christmas, you know, to family and things like that. But me and my husband did the sacrifices we had to do until today to get us where we want to get. And it's ours. We're not dependent. We don't feel like we can't even enjoy the things that we have in our life because we're constantly paying debt. So, you know, it's better to go easy, step by step, slower, but then it's yours and you sleep great at night and you don't have bill collectors calling you. Yeah. And, and it's about valuing what really is important in life. And look at a situation like now. We have the COVID-19, okay? Those people who didn't have a cent in their bank account, they were caught by surprise. I mean, if we live paycheck to paycheck and half 50% of the population lose their paycheck, then they have to, uh, I mean, God bless the Canadian government that really is helping us a lot. But if Absolutely. it wasn't for that, a lot of people will be, uh, in fact, there have been rent strikes, people who uh, either cannot afford to pay their rent or refuses to pay their rent. And if we just are a little bit more disciplined with our personal finance, then we wouldn't have to face those difficult situations. Absolutely. And like you said, thank God we're in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> because we are spoiled. We are spoiled with so much help. And I know it comes from our taxes and so forth. But if we were somewhere else, we would not be so lucky. Our, if we're talking about student debt, think about our neighbors to the south. I mean, that's like double, triple their debt. Right. Uh, we have to, why not uh, be grateful for the services that we have, but let's use those as tools. You know, when we talk about a line of credit, a credit card, they're supposed to be financial tools to help us um, invest maybe in studies, invest in something that's going to uh, create a heritage for ourselves and our family or a community. They're tools. Right, <laughs> they right. shouldn't be there to imprison us. Right. Okay. So you got that first job. I mean, right off the uh, start. So what happened after that? Absolutely. So I was a crime prevention counselor wow. <laughs> and a, a, a safety counselor, basically uh, for a program called Tandem, which is a 30 year old program from the city of Montreal. Uh, and um, it was under a nonprofit organization called Prevention Cotenez and DG that still exists until now. And I was uh, basically a counselor and an animator uh, offering workshops and conferences and creating programs within the community all to fight against um, uh, violence and different types of crimes and so forth and just creating a sense of community uh, for that borough. And it was an amazing experience and I was so blessed uh, to have a director that really allowed us to take initiatives. Uh, the first thing I did is review all the programs that I had to offer and I translated in English and in Spanish. So we went to get more partnerships in the community. And, you know, uh, it was so amazing to be able to work with youth and work with seniors and work with women and work with new arrived immigrants. Again, such a great school uh, for me, but I was so passionate about always improving the system and improving how we work just because of the background that I had. And that just led me uh, to my director uh, 
asking me to coach her to create a peer review program. And I did that in collaboration with another a student from uh, Concordia University who was doing a stage with us. He was in the John Molson uh, business program. And together with a few colleagues, we implemented a few different programs. And that just uh, gave me more of a hunger to not so much animate what I was doing and the topics that I was doing, but really talk about the organization. And I started having contracts outside of my um, of my uh, work uh, to come and give conferences and coach and workshops. And that's really what pushed me to start my business. Okay, so you were getting confidence because you were getting invited, you were doing this and that. However, um, you know, letting go of that steady paycheck to go into your own, your own business. Uh, I, I assume it wasn't just, oh, and I just started my own business. <laughs> can you, can you take <laughs> us through the mental, all the mental talk, the good guy versus the bad guy on your shoulders telling you do this or don't do the other? Absolutely. So it was, uh, I had the honor of uh, creating a um, training program with my organization in an international organization and go to Peru for a week with my colleague. And that's what really made me decide, Yasmina, you have to go in business for yourself. I didn't know if it would be a nonprofit or a private business, but I knew that was the last thing that was going to push me. However, when I came back to Montreal, the program went great and all that. We had to evaluate and all that. I kept having doubt like who do you think you are <laughs> right. you know uh which i was surprised of because um i think i know what uh, what my strengths are is what are the areas that i need to improve at that time as well like today i'm always learning but for whatever reason fear was just over me because i already had children with my husband my husband was in business as well And I've seen the ups and downs, you know, and his industry is even more challenging in the, in the music industry. And every we were coming out of a recession in Quebec at that time. So everyone was telling me, are you crazy? You have three children. Your husband is in production and music. Forget about it. I did not get the support that I thought I was going to get, not even from my family who are entrepreneurs. But something inside of me said, Yasmina, are you going to regret it? Always asking you if it would have worked out. Right. Don't you want to try it? And so it took a process of probably six to eight months mm -hmm. uh, before I made up my mind. And I talked to my director. I, I think she felt it was coming for some reason. And she said, Yasmina, whatever I could do to support you, for you to transition, I don't want you to go, but whatever I can do. And she supported me and allowed me to work my 30 hours in four days instead of five, so I could build my business plan. And I did that with Compagnie F, which is a nonprofit organization that helps women entrepreneurs that still exists until today. Wow, okay. And you just mentioned woman entrepreneur, and we all know that there are way less women entrepreneur than men, uh, probably because that's, those are our typical roles in society. But can you tell us of any uh, any uh, hardship or disadvantage or uh, how do you feel as a woman in particular to start your own thing? Absolutely. Well, I can't speak for other people. I could just speak about the fears and the obstacles that I experience. And I know that a lot of women entrepreneurs have experienced similar things. Uh, I found myself in many situations being, first of all, the youngest there. Wow. Uh, being the only person of another ethnical background, uh, being the woman and having men sit, you know, I'm sitting at a meeting, hopefully to get a contract with a potential client to, to offer training to their teams and so forth. Because I coach, but I also offer a corporate training and not the person, not at all talking to me for what I was there for, but saying, oh, how erotic is your name? And how old are you? And are you married? And having to stand up for myself and shaking sometimes because the frustration level goes up when you that happens to you time and time again. You know, so I really had to learn how to manage uh, myself in those situations. But I stood up for myself, even if it was hard, even if I needed the contract for me and my family and said, listen, I came here for this, this and that. 
And if you can't talk to me with respect, well, I wish you a good day. And I tried to always remain professional, even though it was very hard, Alain. Sometimes wow. you just want to tell a person off. But in the same time as I had those negative experiences, I've had many beautiful experiences with people that have nothing to do with me. You know, a 50-year-old white man that has nothing to do with any of my experiences to just believe in me and say, you know what? I want to hire you and I want you to come and give a conference. And I like how you think. I think we could go work well together. So as many as you could have negatives, you have a lot of people that are just open-minded and they don't, they're not looking as if you're different than them because of you're, you're a woman or you have another background or whatnot. They really want to see the value that you could add to them and to their businesses and their team. So uh, I try to stay focused on that, but I can't, I can't stress enough that it's, it, it has been hard and it has, it, it's gotten better just because with years you start to establish your network. Right. So you attract more people with that mindset. And I think our society is changing as well. I mean, it's in our face. It's the right thing to do. And when we are reminded over and over what is the right thing, that we shouldn't have sexism or racism of all these isms, then, uh, you know, we are evolving. I mean, at one time in society, we used to hit each other with uh, sticks. And now, <laughs> now, you know, now the police hit us with sticks. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, uh, my my business partner, who's a woman, she tells me that women, they are raised to be people pleaser. And then it takes a, a, a long time to break through that barrier that no, we are just individuals as everybody else. So yeah, yeah. congratulations. And, and you taking that step, you are Uh, opening the path for other women who get to see, oh, if she can do it, if Yashmina can do it, I can do it as well. And the more women that we have in position of leadership, the more that will follow. So that, that is just ex ex fantastic. Absolutely. And, and Alain, if I could add something to that, you know, everyone has a different personality, yeah? whether you're a man or a woman. And for me, that it, I've, gone through those situations and things much worse than that that have nothing to do with business but uh, my character I already have a strong character just how I was raised and I think all the things that I've been through uh, as when I was young and my family has been through but not every woman is outspoken like me or uh, you know uh, charismatic or whatnot but doesn't mean they're not leaders right. so a lot of the conversations I have with other women to encourage them is really, you know, work from a place of authenticity. Leadership comes in many forms. You don't always have to be the one to talk. You don't always have to be the one uh, involved in and upfront. Uh, there's a lot of leadership that's done behind the scenes that's done with a completely different approach. It doesn't take away from the power that you have and the influence you could have. Uh, because I think a lot of times, um, Even within a woman's circle, we're trying to impose leadership that is very male oriented. Mm -hmm. And instead of respecting our differences and empowering us in those differences. So I think it was important for me to mention that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you took the plunge, you started your business. Can you now describe a little bit more in detail your business? Yeah, absolutely. So I offer business coaching. That's generally uh, for entrepreneurs or partners who are starting off or have a young uh, company, maybe five years uh, in existence or less. And it's really about decision making. It's really about strategic planning. And uh, as much as um, through the business coaching, I help them establish an action plan, clear objectives, actions, budget, so forth, and follow them through that implementation to make sure it gets done and they reach where they have to go. There's also the aspect of business coaching that has to do with their personal leadership, how to relate to business partners, to their employees, uh, to people that they contract and so forth with their clients as well, uh, to, for them to gain that confidence as well. I also, in the last few years, I had the honor of working with a lot of executives and people in management roles, uh, usually for small to, uh, within small to medium sized businesses. And for them, it's usually they're transitioning in their role or they're having a difficulty and we're working a lot on mindset and leadership, but also how can they uh, improve their communication and the way they organize 
certain departments or work teams or so forth. So both them and their team can thrive. And obviously, at the end of the day, they're focused on sales and performance. But I have a lot of a human approach to the coaching that I offer them. Great. Okay. And I just found out not too long ago that you just reached your eight years of working in business. And yes. to celebrate that, you offer a free series of videos that uh, that we could use as lessons in entrepreneurship. So I wonder if you could, in a few minutes, just tell us uh, each uh, about each one of those lessons. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. So yeah, eight years a lot of hard work and sacrifices. <laughs> um, the first one, is, and we talk a lot about this, is, is I don't think there's nothing new in what I'm going to be sharing, but it's great reminders. The first one is being authentic. You know, uh, I think uh, most of us uh, have the maturity to understand uh, what are our strengths and what areas of ourselves we have to improve. And just because you know, you're constantly trying to improve an area of yourself uh, doesn't mean that you can't succeed. You just have to be real about it. You know, uh, We have to be authentic. We have to be humble about that as well, as much as what we have to offer as you know, what we're still working on. And I think when we function in that way and we communicate with our clients, with collaborators, with you know, uh, someone like you who uh, invites me to talk about my journey and all that on your show, So we really have to operate from that authenticity and you cannot operate from there if you have no idea who you are and you don't ask yourself those questions. So before talking about any type of success in your career or in your business journey, uh, I really encourage people to invest in their self growth because uh, that's the best way you could establish a good life for yourself and have a positive impact in your community. Um, that comes with learning. I talked about learning how to learn wow. what works for you. Not everybody learns behind uh, uh, in a classroom. Some people are better to read books, to listen to podcasts such as yours, to have debates and conversations. So we have to know what works best for us. Some people learn better in a group or individually. And then there's what we have to unlearn, everything that mm -hmm. is a barrier to us or bad habits or, or uh, bad ways of thinking and behaviors. Right. Um, and, and sometimes we have to relearn as well. We've learned something, but we haven't used it. And now comes the time to go dig back in our memory and go a little bit deeper in the topic. Um, I don't want to go into detail for all of this, but there's the importance of be taking accountability for yourself especially when you do a mistake, it's important to mention it to your teammates, acknowledge it, and then work on, this, on finding a solution and seeing how you could prevent that. We're often in a society where we blame everybody else, mm. but we don't take responsibility for ourselves. And even if you haven't made a mistake, but you're working in a team, take accountability in the name of your team. Right. You know? um, so that's very important. And, As, as much as with partnerships or collaborations as with your clients. Um, another amazing lesson, and I think it's important for everybody, but especially for mom entrepreneurs, um, and I think you'll understand why, learning how to say no. Uh, as moms and most women, uh, like you said, we like to please everybody and we like to help everybody and we neglect ourselves. And it's very easy for us to burn ourselves out. I've been very close to that many times, unfortunately, uh, mostly because I'm very passionate about everything that I'm involved with. If not, if I'm not passionate about it, I'm not involved. So that's been very hard for me to, I had to learn time and time again how to say no, even when I am very interested about the opportunity to better manage my energy and my schedule and be, stay strong to be able to be the woman and the mom and the business owner that I want to be, you know, not to uh, spread myself too thin. And that's the same thing for entrepreneurs, especially when entrepreneurs are starting off. They want the visibility, so they say yes to a bunch of things, mm -hmm. even if it's free, and that's okay. I, I, I believe in investing in your community as well, obviously. Uh, but then a lot of times people are not there to help them out. So we have to be strategic about how we use our time. 
Uh, and learning no is definitely something important. Uh, I talked about investing in yourself, not just your business. We invest in a nice suit to look good, to do our nails, our hair, have a nice car, whatever it is, but not in our personal growth, like I said before. And that's so important. And the, the three other lessons is uh, we often talk about uh, cash flow is king, but I like to say that follow-ups are queen. If you meet somebody, follow up, even if you're not going to necessarily work with them or they might not become your client or vice versa, have that respect, not just to network for the sake of networking and accumulating numbers. Take the time to get to know people. Uh, and if you say something, follow up. It's, mm. it's a mutual respect, I think, that we could offer each other. Um, the last two one is learning how to recognize and let go of what's unnecessary in your life. You know, are you spending, I don't know, uh, money every month on a magazine that you don't even read or on a course that you never completed or on a gym membership and you're not using it, you know, or certain expenses for the business. We're part of so many different groups and we don't even attend the, the, the events. Let's be smart on uh, getting rid of everything that's unnecessary, people that are negative in our lives, unnecessary negative thoughts to really try to focus. And all of these lessons, including the last one to take action, you could talk all you want, but if you don't take action, you're not going to see the results. All of these lessons, I think people can really connect with, whether it's in the business realm or in their personal lives. And that's why I focus on them. But trust me, I learned so much more. I would need a lot of time to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, wow. That, that's that's a great list. Uh, let's go back for a second for auto authenticity. Mm -hmm. and And how do we know who we really are. I mean, we are, we have so many influences. I mean, from the moment that you wake up, you are bombarded with advertisement and, and expectations. And so many times you don't know if you desire to, I don't know, uh, have a vacation, for example, in Bahamas is really what you really desire Oh, it's just because you have been bombarded with that advertisement over every summer. It's the same advertisement and you have to go to the Bahamas if you want to be happy. So we really don't know at the end of the day, is this really what I really want? Or, or is this the subliminal message <laughs> implanted in my head over thousands of times of seeing the same advertisement? Absolutely. Well, I, I think that, uh, first of all, it's a life process. It is a life process. And the reality, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on being constantly happy. Mm -hmm. And that's sad because we're humans and we have an array of emotions. Uh, so we have to respect if we're going through a rough time, we have to respect that. If we're confused, uh, we're not happy with ourselves, we're disappointed in ourselves, maybe our actions or we're not where we want to be we have to give ourselves the time to live that and go through that emotion as much as being able to express when we're happy or excited about something. Uh, so it starts with respecting ourselves and that's a lifelong journey. And how do we know? Well, it's, it's easy, just as easy as writing on a piece of paper, what type of person we want to be whether it's in our personal lives, with our community, our family, whether it's in our profession or as a business owner, um, whatever we have chosen, understand who we are now, everything we have working for us inside of ourselves and, you know, the different tools that we have around us as well uh, in our network and all that and understanding what we want to change in ourselves. So it's taking a picture of the present moment and then perhaps drafting or having a conversation with ourselves about who we want to become later. Right. And to gap that, well, what actions? If I keep complaining that I'm 30 pounds overweight and I am, the last two years I've lived so much stress, good stress, but the stress has made me gain so much weight um, I was surprised because you're thinking if you're living such great, amazing experiences, uh, it wouldn't have that effect on your body. And it does. And everyone's different. Some people become very skinny. Who knows? But if I'm going to complain about that and then I don't exercise, I don't walk, uh, I, I don't eat properly, 
then how am I going to get to the goal that I want? And it's right. the same thing in your career. It's the same thing with your relationships. If there's you're suffering in a business relationship or a personal relationship, take a picture of what it is now and what you would like to be. Of course, we could only control what we do, not what other right. people do. Right. So uh, it's just it's a constant work. I like there's I'm not the type of coach that says seven tips to a miracle. No, I don't believe in that. You have to understand who you are and what's going to work for you and adjust and try different things. Anybody that tries to sell you a magic formula, try to run away, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not so simple. Jasmine, <laughs> uh, this has been amazing. I wonder if there's any question that I neglected to ask you. And if not, then uh, please tell us your website or where can people learn more about your projects and programs and, and courses and whatever is it that you have to offer. Thank you. And I would certainly do that, Alain, but I hope you don't mind. You know, we talked about uh, some of the obstacles I've been and I have to acknowledge what's going on in the States right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yesterday was uh, Blackout Tuesday. Um, we're seeing so many men and women and children being killed, uh, so much discrimination and races, particularly for the diverse community, uh, uh, black community. And we say there's none of that here in Quebec or in Canada, which is a lie. Uh, but I have to acknowledge what, what, what we're living this week and what we've been living. And I just want to encourage people. I don't care what background you are, what religion, what your orientation If you know what it is to be discriminated, if uh, you wouldn't want violence against yourself, against somebody else for your color, your religion, your orientation, it's time to stand up. I just want to share that message because uh, I know what it is to go through discrimination and I'm half Spanish, half Moroccan uh, and I live it. And I see it on a day-to-day -day basis because my husband is born here, but he's of Haitian descent. My children are mixed. Uh, they have all these rich cultures and history inside of their blood. And um, it's I'm scared for my children. I'm scared mm. for me. I'm scared for my community. And I just felt it was important for me to use uh, this beautiful platform that you have to just send a lot of love and encouragement and prayer out there. Well, I, this, I was having a conversation yesterday with my business partner and we were saying like we have such a privileged life here and uh, we were asking ourselves uh, how can we help out or, 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 or bring out our voice or support to this, to this injustice going on. And, and the one thing that came to my mind is that in the past, I have heard here and there a racial comment and I haven't had the courage to say that's wrong, you know, mm -hmm. to point out just because we don't want to make noise and we don't want to whatever damage, whatever, or look bad or whatever. But I, I think it's time to have the courage whenever we see injustice, just not to look the other way and, and just wash our hands saying, okay, that's them and that's not me, but actually have the courage to just say something, you know, that is not acceptable. Okay. This is racism. Okay. And, you know, if this is the kind of uh, thinking, I rather not uh, have an interaction with you. Yeah. And so I, I feel that I, in the past, I lacked the courage to say something, but no more, you know, because there's real injustice going on. There is people who are dying for the crime of being of a different race. And it's time that we raise our voice and say enough is enough. Absolutely. And I really appreciate you saying that. And, you know, just an example, this week I went to buy some new running shoes for me and my children and my husband. And the store owner would not acknowledge my husband. My husband say, oh, so how has it been with COVID and so forth? And he only looked at me. And that's like, can you imagine us? We have Hispanic heritage and so forth. I have Arabic heritage as well. We don't have to wake up every day and say, okay, I better dress like this and I better speak like this and, and be at our hundred percent to hopefully not get someone to disrespect us like that. But as a black woman and black man, every day, everything they do, even if they're 
the president of a company. This is the reality. Imagine you're going to spend $200, $300 in a store for you and your family, and the store owner does not look at you in your eyes. That is not acceptable. We don't have to wait for people to get killed. Someone living that every day, all day long, what does it do to a person? It's, it's too much. It's too much. And I witness it by myself from other people, see it with my husband. I had people push on me with a carriage in a, a suit in a store because I'm with a black man. That is not acceptable. We're humans. And so, uh, you know, Ale, I really appreciate you letting me take a few more minutes to talk about that. It's so important that we do not remain silent. Do you, I will never go back to that store. I, even if I never have to buy running shoes again, I will never go back to that store. That is not acceptable. And anybody that doesn't stand up, I will not support their business. I will not support them. I will not support their organization. Another thing that I, I mentioned this morning, where are all the nonprofit organizations who use our tax money to help entrepreneurs from different backgrounds and they're in silence right now? That is not acceptable. I'm not going to refer any more clients to them. That is not a, that's hypocrisy. Even right. if they have people from diverse backgrounds and from the black community as their employees. So we have to it ha, it's beyond business, it's beyond money. Like what legacy are we leaving for? It, just because it's not happening directly to us. Um, I really want to inspire people and I, I want my legacy and my family's legacy to say we stand up for what's right, no matter the consequences. Well said. Okay, last thing. Uh, where can people find your <laughs> website? And, <laughs> and it's a you, heavy topic. It's a yes. heavy topic. Well, I invite people, you know, my name is Yasmina Jimenez. Uh, you could definitely find me on LinkedIn. Uh, but if you want to go check out my website, that's myworkshopmycoach.com. And I even have a great 1-800 number that you could call or text me at. And that's at one 855 coach Uh, but certainly on social media, uh, you could find me uh, just by uh, typing my name. It'll be my pleasure to talk to anybody, whether you're considering coaching or training or perhaps just wants, want to pick my brain a little bit. Thank you so much for your time, Jasmina. Thank you, Ale. It was a pleasure. And uh, I'll talk to you soon outside of the show. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, so, Jasmina, if you don't mind, I like that last part because it's so appropriate and timely. I'm going to uh, post just those last few minutes of our conversation. Uh, uh, and, okay, great. That sounds uh, great. So it's going to be, I don't know, about three weeks before I post this uh, because I have other ones already recorded. No problem. But uh, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. And Thank I you, hope Ale. to uh, one day when life goes back to normal to be able to shake your hand in person. Absolutely. And I'm looking for a salsa uh, dancing. <laughs> okay. Have a soon. great day, Ale. Bye. Gracias. De nada.